Welcome back. So far we've spent a good deal of time thinking about what critical reasoning is not. We've said, in particular, that critical reasoning is not the kind of thinking that is interfered with by emotions. And that point is more or less familiar, uh, just because the emotions themselves are more or less familiar. Clearly anyone who is thinking while angry or frustrated or afraid is not putting himself in the best position to reason critically. And we also said that critical reasoning is not the sort of reasoning that is interfered with by what we called cognitive biases. Now that notion was a bit less familiar than the emotions, and so we spent a bit of time talking about what those are, and then we watched a film in which they seemed to figure quite prominently. But the time has come to say something about what critical reasoning is, okay? And the primary notion that is at the heart of critical thinking, and indeed in some ways at the heart of philosophy quite generally, is the notion of argument. Okay? An argument is supposed to encapsulate a reason for believing something. It answers the question of why we believe something. Now, there's an important distinction here that we have to bear in mind. If we think about the question, why we believe a thing, well, there are many different routes that an answer might take. One sort of answer is to explain the causal process whereby we came to believe the things that we believe. So, a sort of infamous example of this, for example, involves Jonathan Edwards, who was one time running for Vice President of the United States. And Edwards was asked why he believed that homosexuals had no right to get married. And Edward's response was to say that he was simply brought up that way. Okay? Now, that response explains all right how it is that he came to have the belief that he held. Nevertheless, it counts as a kind of evasion of the question, because clearly what the questioner was looking for was not an answer to why he believes in the sense of what the mechanisms were whereby he came to have that belief, but rather what his reason is. For that belief? Does he have some evidence for that opinion? Does he have some sort of uh, justification for his position? Now, a second way of understanding the question, why I believe a thing, is to ask about which practical motivations entice me to believe in it. So, for example, uh, the French philosopher Blaise Pascal has a very famous example to this effect. And his argument is now called Pascal's Wager. And the idea is that belief in God is suggested not by the evidence or by some clever argumentation, but by the rewards that we stand to get if we believe correctly. Okay. <coughs> And so one might come to believe in God simply on the basis that things will tend to work out better for him on the whole if he believes, rather than if he believes not. And so that kind of process might also explain why one comes to believe something, but that too fails to provide an explanation of my reason for believing a thing, my justification for believing a thing, my warrant my evidence for believing the thing. And that's really what an argument is supposed to give us. Some kind of rational basis, independent of causes, independent of my inclinations or my desires or my wants, but some kind of pure rational basis or evidence for believing the thing. Now, <clears throat> an argument is made up out of two parts. There's a set of starting assumptions, and these are often called premises. And those can be one or many. If you go on to study logic, uh, you'll find that in fact a certain special kind of argument can have no premises at all. But typically when we argue we start from some baseline assumptions. Okay? But that's the body of the argument. And then, of course, there's the point for which we are arguing. There's the conclusion of the argument. 
So there's really those two halves of an argument. And the idea is that the premises are supposed in some way to provide some rational basis for accepting the truth of the conclusion. Now, <clears throat> it's often the case that uh, when we argue in a sort of informal, everyday kind of way, we don't state every single premise or sometimes even the conclusion in our arguments that we make. So, for example, if someone says, well, no one can drink unless he's 21, therefore Bob won't be able to drink, well, <clears throat> that might be a perfectly good argument, but of course, there's a premise that's left out of that argument. Which premise is it? Well, think about it. No one will be able to drink unless he's 21, therefore Bob won't be able to drink. Well, clearly the the acceptability of that kind of reasoning turns on an unstated premise, which is that Bob is himself under age 21. Okay. Now, we often leave those premises out because either they're clearly supported by the people we're talking to, or they don't need to be mentioned for some other reason. Um, of course, sometimes they're left out because for the, for the reason that they are controversial, and we want to try to sneak ahead to our conclusion without uh, letting our audience in on the fact that, in fact, the conclusion turns on some very complicated or controversial point. Okay. So there may be many reasons for leaving out premises or leaving out conclusions, but in this class, we want to try to make everything as explicit as possible. We want to try to fill out our argument all the way, as it were. And in fact, this is a good strategy for any philosophy class that you take. In many ways, it's the equivalent in a math class of showing your work. Okay? Because again, we want to explore not so much what we believe, but why we believe what we believe. And these arguments are the answers to those why questions. Okay. <clears throat> now, there's really two forms of argument that we need to concern ourselves with. Okay? And those two forms are called deduction and induction. Let's write those down. Maybe we'll use a different color now. Deduction. And induction. Now, <clears throat> you'll often hear, sometimes, not so often maybe, but sometimes you'll hear other sorts of argument mentioned, like abduction or inference to the best explanation, or causal arguments. Many of these other kinds of arguments get lumped into the notion of, of induction. Okay, so induction is sometimes a bit of a, a, a catch-all for, in effect, arguments that are not deductive. But, in any case, most of the arguments we look at can quite usefully be put into either of these two categories, deduction and induction. Okay, now here's the difference between the two. Uh, when one argues deductively, the idea is that the premises I, I give are supposed to provide an absolute logical guarantee of my conclusion. Okay? So when I argue in deductive form, what I'm purporting to do is to demonstrate, logically, my conclusion from a certain set of premises. Okay, and so the, the implicit claim I make when I make a deductive argument is that if my premises are true, then you must also accept my conclusion. On pain of irrationality, on pain of illogicality. Okay? That is, that if my premises are true, then uh, the possibility that my conclusion is false is absolutely zero. Okay. But notice that in most everyday uses of argumentation, we don't have anywhere near that kind of demand on the certainty of what we come to believe. Okay. <clears throat> so, for example, uh, if, if I ask you why you believe that your friend Matt will meet you tonight at 8 o'clock, and you say to me, 
Well, he told me that he would meet me at 8 o'clock. He gets done working at 7.30, and we picked a place to meet and so on. And maybe we've had this history of meeting at 8 o'clock for the last several weeks or something like that. Well, that's a perfectly good argument, okay? And you might have a perfectly good reason for believing that you will meet your friend Matt at 8 o'clock. But notice that you have a perfectly good reason for meeting Matt at 8 o'clock, maybe, even in spite of the fact that you had no intention at all of trying to demonstrate without any doubt at all that you, you would meet your friend Matt at 8 o'clock that day. So very often we have a much lower standard for the certainty of the conclusions that we ought to believe. And when we argue in this, in this looser sort of way, well, we're arguing inductively. Okay? And so when we argue inductively, the claim is merely going to be that the premises that we start with make the conclusion more likely than not. Okay? That is, whereas in a deductive argument, we are saying that the premises are supposed to guarantee the truth of the conclusion with no room for logical doubt at all, when we argue inductively, the claim is going to be the rather uh, less strong idea that the premises will make the conclusion more likely than not. Okay? Whereas, of course, that allows for the possibility that uh, uh, the premises could be true and the conclusion, after all, false. Okay? Sometimes we go wrong. Maybe your friend Matt will get a flat tire from work and he won't be able to meet you at 8 o'clock. Okay? But that doesn't mean that you didn't have a good reason for thinking that you would meet him at 8 o'clock. Okay. <clears throat> now... Um, I think it's useful when we're first starting out with these notions to get a sense of what sort of times and contexts each style of argument is appropriate in. Okay? So the, um, the notion of deduction, let's start with that. When we think about deduction, the kinds of things that we have in mind are the arguments that mathematicians give, arguments based on the definitions of things, uh, and arguments that take a kind of syllogistic form. Okay, we'll get to this notion later in the course, but there's a, an old style of argumentation that Aristotle explored a long time ago, often called the categorical syllogism. We'll come to this. And those arguments, too, count as deductive arguments. Okay. Uh, it's very often the case that... Uh, an arguer doesn't say whether he means to argue deductively or inductively. That is, whether he means to prove his, his conclusion without any doubts, or whether he intends only to give some reason for accepting it. Okay? So again, that's why it can help to have this in our minds when we should expect deductive arguments, when we should expect inductive arguments. Okay? So deduction, think mathematics, think arguments based on definitions, think pure philosophical conceptual arguments, that kind of style. Okay. Inductive arguments, on the other hand, think natural science, uh, think arguments from analogy, think appeals to authority. Right? Think about the notion of, a, of appeal to authority. We'll talk about this later. Well, <clears throat> if I say to you that you ought to believe something because an authority on the subject says so, well, that may be a good argument if indeed the person to whom I point is indeed an authority on the subject. But even if he is, still his authoritarian voice isn't going to be absolute proof of the thing that I'm telling you to believe. It might be very good evidence, but it won't be logical proof. Okay. Um, the most kind of uh, the most common form of inductive argument probably is a kind of generalization, okay, and this is in effect at the bottom of the scientific method. So, for example, I witness a bunch of crows, and all the crows I've seen have been black. Well, if I think of each of those observations of crows as a premise in my argument, well, then a certain conclusion naturally comes to mind, namely that. All crows are black. Okay? And presumably, the greater the number of observations I have of black crows, the stronger my argument is. 
And that's true even though no matter how many crows I see, unless I suppose I see them all, but that's probably a physical impossibility, no matter how many crows I see, even if they're all black, still there won't be any kind of logical proof from the fact that I've seen all these black crows to the claim that all of them, even the ones I haven't seen, or all the ones that will ever be, are black. Okay? Again, it might still be a good reason to believe that all crows are black, but it won't be logical guarantee. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the critical notion for today is uh, a feature of deductive arguments that we want to try to capture. Now, what makes a deductive argument good? Well, obviously we we'd like to have true premises. Okay, that's sort of a given. But there's another critical feature, which is that we need our premises to connect to the conclusion in the right sort of way. Okay? And that notion is captured by what philosophers call validity. Now, validity is one of those notions that many people struggle with upon first hearing. And my recommendation to you is just to practice with it over and over again until, until it's clear in your mind. I provided a worksheet, uh, check for that on the website, that can help with this, with, with this tricky notion. Okay. But let's write down, for now, what it means for an argument to be valid. Let's just write down the definition. Okay. Well, here we go. argument is deductively valid, and now I'm going to, of course, explain what it takes to be deductively valid. So I'll write here, if and only if, what? Well, here's what it takes for an argument to be valid. Now remember, the idea is to try to capture the notion that <coughs> the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion. So one way of putting that is like this. It is impossible that what? Well, that the premises are all true and the conclusion false. Okay? An argument is deductively valid just in case, if and only if, it is impossible for its premises to be true and its conclusion false. Do you need to see it up close? Let's get the camera a little bit closer for a second. There. An argument is deductively valid just in case it is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. Okay, got it? So here's the idea. Uh, <clears throat> the premises of a, of a valid deductive argument, well, they may be either true or false. But what counts, if we're talking about the validity of the argument, is whether they guarantee the conclusion. So that is, whether if they are true, or if they were true, perhaps counterfactually, would they, if they were true, force the conclusion also to be true? That's the question. Okay. Is it possible, that is, for all the premises to be true, and yet the conclusion false? If that's possible, then the argument is invalid. And if it's impossible, as we've said here, 
then the argument is valid. Okay. <clears throat> Again, this will take some practice to get your mind around the notion, but it's absolutely central in philosophy, certainly in critical reasoning, and so it's, it's extremely important that you get it. Okay. <clears throat> now, here's something sort of strange about the notion of validity. This definition, as we have it, allows for a certain uh, a pair of oddball types of arguments to count as valid. Okay. So, for example, if you have an argument that has a conclusion which itself could not fail to be true, that is, an argument with the conclusion that must be true, well, then that argument, with any premises at all, is going to count as valid. Why? Well, check the definition. If it's impossible for the conclusion to be false, well, then of course it would be impossible for the conclusion to be false, as well as have the premises true. Okay? So, if you've got an argument with an impossibly false conclusion, that is, with a necessarily true conclusion, your argument is guaranteed to be valid. And similarly, if you have an argument that has a premise that is guaranteed to be false, that is, if you have an argument with an impossible premise, or a necessarily false premise, well, that argument too is guaranteed to be valid. Why? For the same reason. Okay. Uh, if it's impossible for all the premises to be true, because one of them must be false, well then of course it will be impossible for all the premises to be true and have the conclusion false. Okay. So you have to be aware of these strange little quirks about the definition. Now, uh, there's another question as to why we would want, would want to count such strange arguments as valid, but I think I can answer that too. And here's the answer. The point about defining the notion of validity, right, the kind of feature of argumentation that we want to capture is, well, we want to make sure that we never go from true premises to a false conclusion. That's clearly bad reasoning, if we manage somehow to do that. If you give us a bunch of true claims as starting assumptions, and we <clears throat> reason in such a way that we arrive at some false claim as conclusion of some uh, set of those premises, then clearly we've done something wrong. Okay? And so the idea is, that's the kind of argument we must avoid at all costs. Right? True premises, false conclusion. Now, if we start with a bunch of false premises, or some false premises, well, uh, then it's not really any bother if we end up with some false conclusions, right? It doesn't show that we've done anything wrong in our reasoning. It just shows that we started with some false premises until we're bound to end up with some false conclusions, too. Okay. Uh, but, again, what we have to avoid is starting with a bunch of true claims and arriving at something false. And so that's what the notion of validity is designed to capture. An argument that can't possibly do that. Okay. Now, another word about the nature of possibility. <clears throat> possibility does not mean truth. And necessity does not mean truth. Okay? And even if premises happen to be true, they might still be possibly false. And even if a conclusion is false, it might still be possibly true, and so on. Okay. So here's what we have in mind. Well, a possibility, think of a possibility, in fact there's quite a lot of philosophical debate about what exactly these possibilities are. Um, <clears throat> if you think about, for example, the possibility of this marker having been blue, well that seems to be a possibility. Um, but what sort of fact or statement is that. This marker is, of course, not blue. And so there's no <clears throat> thing corresponding to the possibility of this marker having been blue. But still, it seems to be a possibility. And so there's some questions about what sort of status or truth or being or reality or substance there is to that bare possibility which has not been actualized of this marker having been blue. Okay. <clears throat> But the basic idea is that a possibility is a way the world might have been. Now, of course, the way the world is is a way the world might have been, 
So for example, this marker being red and this shirt being red and that sort of thing. But there are ever so many ways in which the world might have been, but isn't. Okay? This marker having been blue is of course one, but the world being covered with uh, carcasses of dinosaurs for 300 billion years is another possibility. It's a way the world might have been. It's not a way the world is, but it's a way the world might have been. Okay. Uh, well, what are the ways in which the world might have been? Well, it's really any way that's coherent. Any description that uh, doesn't have any sort of contradictions embedded in it. Okay. Uh, so, the, in fact, the notion of possibility is extremely liberal. Um, you know, imagine a world that has nothing but 6,000 mice and two rocks. Okay. Well, it's hard to imagine that sort of world, but is it possible? Well, sure. There's nothing contradictory in that description. There's nothing sort of inherently impossible in that description. It's certainly not how <coughs> the world is, but it does seem like it's a w way in which the world might have been. Okay. So the idea is going to be now, with this very liberal understanding of possibility, to apply this definition of validity. Okay. <clears throat> now, the uh, notion of induction comes with its own sort of demands on what makes a good inductive argument. Remember that this notion of validity applies only ever to deductive arguments. Okay. It's never even really appropriate to ask whether an inductive argument is valid. That's just not the right sort of category to use in trying to assess the strength of an, in of an inductive argument. Okay. Uh, so for turning now to induction, let's, let's erase this, this notion of validity because it's not applicable to inductive arguments. Okay, let's do that. So turning now to induction, well, there's a correlative notion, correlative that is to deductive validity. <clears throat> and again, the rough idea is that we want some connection between the premises and the conclusion. But this time, we're not going to demand that the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion. We're going to demand only that the premises give us some reason to accept the truth of the conclusion. Okay. <clears throat> and so the notion here we call strength. Now I'm not going to bother writing down the definition of strength, it's pretty straightforward. An inductive argument is strong to the extent that its premises make its conclusion likely. Now <clears throat> notice something about this notion of strength as opposed to the notion of validity. Whereas the notion of validity is really a kind of black and white thing on or off, Either an argument is valid or it isn't. Of course, it might be difficult to tell which, but still, either an argument is valid or it isn't. Um, here, though, in the case of inductive arguments, this notion of strength is a graded notion. It comes in degrees. Okay? So it's not a black and white affair. It's not the case that some arguments are strong and others are not. Rather, some arguments are stronger than others. Okay. We might still try to have uh, a precise definition we can use by saying, well, let's call strong any argument whose premises make the conclusion at least 50% likely. Okay, that might be one thing you can do. But the notion of strength is fundamentally a graded one, or a notion of degree. Okay. <clears throat> now, there's one final bit of nomenclature for us. As I was saying before, we want not merely, of course, that our premises give some reason for accepting the conclusions of our arguments, but we also want our premises to be true. Okay? So there's really two demands on arguments. <clears throat> now, when we have these demands met in these different kinds of arguments, we have, again, two different names. When we have a valid argument, a, de a deductive argument that's valid, if the premises of that argument are also true, then we call that argument sound. 
So a sound argument is a valid deductive argument that has true premises. Now notice that the definition of validity is such that sound arguments will be guaranteed to have true conclusions. Okay. That is, since validity tells us that if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true, and since soundness tells us that the premises are indeed true, well then we also must have it that the conclusion is true as well. In the case of induction, the terminology goes like this. We have strong arguments, and strong arguments are the ones whose premises make their conclusions likely. And then, among those strong arguments, if the premises uh, of those arguments are in fact true, then we call the resulting argument not just strong, but cogent. Okay? And so cogency is the inductive correlate of the deductive notion of soundness. Okay. Uh, let's stop for now. I'll catch you next time.